So uh, this morning we're continuing our sermon series going through the book of Judges. Um, and I think it's been a really good uh, series so far. And, you know, I would highly encourage you, if you're not, to take time to read uh, the stories uh, on your own, because Judges is a very complicated book. There's a lot of detail, a lot of depth there, and the more time that you spend with it, the more that you're going to get out of it, and the more that the stories that we have time to talk about here on Sunday morning, those stories are going to come to life uh, based on the time that you um, spend on your own time looking at these stories. And, you know, I just finished uh, going through the whole book this week myself, and there are so many great stories in there, uh, but boy, do we have a good one uh, this morning in Judges uh, chapter 9. So before we get to the uh, story itself, I want to take a second and recap uh, this cycle that we've been talking about throughout this uh, sermon series. Uh, and it's called the sin cycle that takes place in the book of Judges. And so Judges um, takes place in the period of time, about 400 years between uh, Moses, Joshua, and then it tells the story of the Israelites settling into the promised land um, before uh, the period of the, of the kings come. And what you see reoccur throughout the book of Judges is called the sin cycle. What happens is, you know, Israel sins, and because of their disobedience, God would use their enemies to basically come in and oppress them. And they would suffer all kinds of tragedy at the hands of their enemies. But in that suffering, they would repent. They would call out to God for assistance. And God would rise up a leader, a judge who would come and lead them to victory, redeem Israel. And then what you see is they have victory and peace during that life of that judge. But then the judge dies and the cycle repeats itself over and over and over and so Judges tells the story of 12 judges that fit the description of this Redeemer for Israel. Now, when we talk about judges, we're talking about military leaders. These are not judges like we think of judges, like, you know, wearing a robe in court. That's not what a judge is talking about in the book of Judges. These are military leaders that rescue uh, Israel. But, you know, buried in this book is one story that totally breaks that mold. Judges spends a whole chapter on this guy named Abimelech. And if Judges is the story of hero leaders, Abimelech is like the anti-hero. He's the antithesis of this story. It's a story about murder, betrayal, conspiracy, revenge, civil war, political killings. And so why did the authors of Judges, why did they include this story in this book? Because it doesn't seem to fit with the narrative, the whole rest of what the story, the book of Judges is about. And so that's going to be one of the questions we wrestle this morning, is why is this story in here? Why do we have a whole chapter talking about this guy named Abimelech? But here's also another challenge that's presented in this story. Is so, you know, we know that good stories have a protagonist, a good guy, and an antagonist, a bad guy, right? And when you read this story, it's like, who's the, who's the good guy here? Who's the bad guy? Like, who, who, who fits these, who, which characters fit this this picture. Who, who are these people? And to help answer that question, I actually want us to do a little activity this morning. Is on your outline, I've come up with what I've called the bad guy scorecard, okay? And here's what I want you to do. As I go through and tell you the story here this morning, I want you to take notes. And basically, here's your three main cast of characters on this outline. And as we go through, if you hear something that you think, that's a bad guy act, I want you to make a little note of it and give it a score. What score? I don't care, okay? Totally subjective. Your point system can be like 1 to 10. It can be, you know, 100 points. It can be shrimp bucks. I don't care whatever, like, you give them, okay? But just whatever score that you want to give. It's kind of subjective, and that's kind of a little bit of the point. Um, and at the end of this, I'm going to ask, uh, okay, who's the bad guy? And we're going to talk about uh, this point system um, because I want you all to be the judge, okay, in this question, who's the bad guy? So let's pray before we jump into the story. Um, God, this morning, Lord, as we wrestle with uh, this story, I pray that you just speak to us all individually. Uh, God, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, the message that you want us to get out of your word uh, this morning. God, I pray uh, that um, you bless us as we spend time uh, in your word this morning. All these things in your son's name. Amen. Okay, so last week, Matt talked about Gideon. And while Gideon certainly had his flaws, he's generally considered to be one of the better uh, judges in the book of Judges. And he was so good that towards the end of his life, we see that the Israelites come to him and they say, this is uh, chapter 8, verse 22, the Israelites said to Gideon, 
Rule over us, you, your son, your grandson, because you have saved us from the hands of Midian. See, things were going so well that Israel went to Gideon and said, we want you to be our leader. We want you to lead us. We want your son to lead us. We want your grandson to lead us. This sounds like a kingdom, right? It sounds like a kingdom. They wanted him to be their king. But you see, this is not just any king. Because at this point in Israel's history, they had had some great leaders. But they hadn't had a king yet. They hadn't had a king. So this wasn't the only opportunity to be a king of Israel. It was an opportunity to be the first king of Israel. I mean, talk about a legacy. Talk about a chance to set yourself up and your family up for this awesome legacy for the rest of your lives. You'd be the first king of Israel. I mean, what an opportunity. This is what Gideon says. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And see, Gideon knew the command that God gave the Israelites when it came to settling in the promised land about their king. It says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 and 15, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, Let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. And see, all the good judges in the book of Judges were all called by God. We're all equipped by God to, to, to do good for his name. And even with Gideon's own calling, Gideon was reluctant to take this because he knew this was a big responsibility. He knew this was a big thing to do. And so he was reluctant to even become a judge, nonetheless become the king of Israel. And so the story of Gideon ends with uh, verse 33. Starts at verse 33. It says, No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all the enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerob Baal, that is Gideon in spite of all the good things that he had done for them. After all the good that Gideon had given Israel, this period of peace, this period of stability, all these good things that Gideon had done, Gideon dies, and it says that they did not show love for all the good that he had done. So this is where Gideon's son Abimelech comes into the story. Gideon had 70 sons. Yes, he had concubines. And Abimelech was a son of one of the concubines, okay? Now, because he was a son of a concubine and not his wife, he had no rights. He, he didn't have a right to the, to the inheritance. He didn't have a right to this lineage. If he would have been king, he had no rights in this. But chapter 9 starts with Abimelech going to his mother's relatives in a city called Shechem. And he goes to the relatives, and he, he quietly convinces them. He says, hey, I want you to go to the leaders of the city, and I want you to convince them to make me their leader. And he says this argument. He says, you know, is it better to be ruled over 70 sons or to be better to rule by one person? And by the way, I'm related to you, so you should let me be your ruler. And so this plan works. And now remember that these are his brothers that he is conspiring against. And these are, and remember Gideon said, my sons are not going to rule over you. I'm not going to rule over you. But nonetheless, Abimelech tries to make this to make himself the next leader. And it says the plan worked and their leaders were inclined to follow Abimelech. Verse 4. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Babarath, and Abimelech used this to hire reckless scoundrels who became his followers. And so two things here. First off, I love that description, reckless scoundrels. Like, I mean, how vivid is that? I was talking to somebody before, and they were like, what scoundrels are not reckless? Like, is there, non -re is there de deliberate scoundrels? I was like, that's a great point, but it says reckless scoundrels. I love that description. The second thing you see here, or actually, before I go in there, you know, this tells you about the folks that he's hiring. Like, these are not good people, right? These are people who would do whatever Abimelech wants them to do for money. He's going, they're basically going to be his thugs. That tells you what kind of leader he's going to be. Not the best and the brightest, but whoever will do whatever he wants because he's paying him. But more importantly, there's a nugget in this as to where the money comes from. 
It says he, they paid for him with money from the temple of one of the pagan gods. So you see this immediate backslide right back into the pagan idolatry. They're paying him money to hire these reckless scoundrels from a temple of one of the pagan gods. So then it gets worse. So Abimelech takes these reckless scoundrels. He goes to his father's home, and it says that he murders all 70 of his brothers, except for one. We'll get there in a little bit. But all, all 70 his brothers. And the Bible says he, he murders them, or kills them, on a single stone. So this is not like death by combat. This is an execution. He executed, he executed his brothers. And why he did this is because he was trying to lock in his rule, and he didn't want any challenges from any of his brothers, even though, one, again, Gideon said, you're not going to rule. Two, even if he was ruling, he was a, he was a son of a, of a concubine, meaning he didn't have a right to the throne anyway. And so he did this because he's trying to eliminate the challenges. Now, how many of those 70 brothers would have wanted to be king? We don't know. I mean, none of them may have been trying to do this. They all been, might have been up there minding their own business, and Bimelech comes up there and kills all 70 of them. Then it says that after the murders, the citizens of Shechem took Abimelech to one of the most sacred areas of the cities and made him king. First king of Israel. And so you think about this for a second. Like, a little bit ago, they had loved Gideon so much that they said, we want you to be our king. Gideon said, no way. And here we are, fast forward a little bit later, and the same people that wanted Gideon to be their king are now making the person who wiped out all of Gideon's sons, they're now anointing him to be their king. And I'll pause here a second and say, you know, what's in it for the people of Shechem? Because there's an interesting undercurrent that's going on throughout this story. See, Shechem had potential to be a major city for the Israelites as they settled into the promised land. There was historical significance because Abraham and Jacob had lived there. Joseph and Jacob were buried there. There was spiritual significance because Shechem is where Abraham received a promise from God uh, of the land, that he would receive the land. After Joshua and the Israelites had conquered the promised land, uh, Joseph gathered all the leaders of all the 12 tribes to Shechem where they basically reaffirmed their promise to live by God's commands. And they even erected a monument there uh, to memorialize that event. And some of the commentators think that where Abimelech was crowned king was actually the exact same spot where Joshua had erected the monument to say, we're going to abide by the commands of God as we settle into this place. So it had historical significance, spiritual significance, and there was also political significance because Shechem was about as center of Israel as you could possibly get uh, in this region. Okay, And so... If there was going to be a new capital of Israel, if there was going to be a king that would have a capital and rule from this one place, Shechem would make a whole heck of a lot of sense to be that place, okay? So what's in it for the people there? They were hoping to ride Abimelech's rise to power for their own political, social, and economic glory. What were they willing to trade for that? Apparently their souls, because they completely turned their back on God, completely turned their back on Gideon, all in the name of trying to advance themselves. So the Bible says that they ruled, uh, that Abimelech ruled for three years uh, until verse 23. Verse 23 says, um, after the three years, God stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem so that they acted treacherously against Abimelech. And so what we have here is there's a new guy that comes to town named Gaul. And Gaul comes to uh, the town of Shechem, to the city of Shechem, and they're throwing this party at, again, one of the temples. And uh, Gaul runs his mouth a little bit to one of Abimelech's uh, officials and basically says, um, he says, if I were in charge, I would bring out, I would tell him to bring out his whole army, which is like biblical smack talk to like bring it, Right? That's basically what he's saying. If I were in charge, I would take him down. Who is this guy that we should be following him? And the people of Shechem are like, hmm, we kind of like this guy. Well, one of uh, Abimelech's officials overhears this and sends word to Abimelech that they're conspiring against them, and of course it ticks him off. So he comes up with a plan that he's going to come down, he's going to ambush Gaul and his men and basically take back um, the city. And so... Uh, 
I love in verse 38, it says that um, right when the point where um, Gaul and his men see Abimelech and his men getting ready to ambush him, um, it says uh, Zabal, who was the official um, who overheard the plan and was the one that warned Abimelech, um, in verse 38, it says, uh, let me find this. It says, then Zabal said to him, where is your big talk now, you who said, who is Abimelech, that we should be subject to you? Aren't you these men that, who ridiculed you? Go out and fight them. Like, I love that. Where's your big talk now, huh? You said, bring it. Here he is. Where's your big talk now? It's like this little smack talk going on. I love it. That part of the story. So anyway, um, so they go out, they have this battle, and Abimelech wins, and Gaul leaves defeated. So Abimelech retakes the city. Uh, you would think that's the end of the story, Right? No, because that's not the kind of king that Abimelech is. Verse 45, it says, All that day Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt all over it. So not only did he kill all the people there, he destroyed the city that, again, had potential to be a really important city in Israel, And it said he scattered salt on the ground. So not only did he kill the people, he destroyed the city, but he made it so nobody could live there because you couldn't grow any crops there. He destroyed the land, made it uninhabitable. So surely that's, I mean, he's done, right? He can't go any worse than that, right? That's not the kind of king that Abimelech is. It goes on to say that those who had escaped this took refuge in a tower uh, that was in the city. And so Abimelech goes to this tower... And he very methodically and deliberately and in cold blood goes out and takes his axe and cuts down brush and builds the brush around the tower. He tells his men to do the same thing, and he sets it on fire. And the Bible says a thousand people died in that fire. So surely, I mean, that's Abimelech's done, right? He can't get any worse than that. Not the kind of king Abimelech is. Then he keeps going. He goes to a neighboring town. He goes to a neighboring town where the people, uh, again, take refuge uh, in a tower. And he shows up, and he's like, oh, a tower. I know how to handle these people, right? So again, he goes, cuts down brush, starts to build uh, the brush pile around the tower to burn it down. Well, what he doesn't know is this time there was a woman who carried up a large millstone to the top of the tower. And the Bible says that as he was going, getting ready to set the thing on fire, this woman chucks this millstone over the edge, And it goes down and cracks his skull. And then we get uh, verse 54. It says, so he's, he's laying there like wounded because this woman threw a stone over, cracked his skull. Hurriedly he called to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me. So they can't say a woman killed him. So a servant ran him through and he died. I mean, ladies, does that offend you a little bit, right? I mean, come on, right? That's the kind of king Abimelech was. So, and also note, this is kind of interesting. Again, it comes full circle. So it says he, kills all of his, he killed all of his brothers on a single stone. What killed him? A single stone, okay? So that's the story of Abimelech. All right, so let's tally up those scores. You should have been keeping score. Let's see how... Let's see how this goes. And I know, I'll I'll give you some time to do some math. I know on your way to church this morning, you didn't think you were going to have to do math this morning, but I'll give you a second uh, to do some numbers. Okay, so here we go. By show of hands, how many of you think that Gaul is the bad guy in this story? Nobody. Gaul gets a free pass. I mean, come on. He's sitting there. Everybody's minding their own business. He goes in. He has a little too much to drink, runs his mouth, and ends up setting off a course of events that kills a bunch of people. You think he's, he's innocent? Do you think he's not the bad guy? Okay, he gets a pass. All right, how many of you people think that the people of Shechem are the bad guys here? Anybody? Nobody, wow, people of Shechem get a pass. What? There's, a, there's a, I kind of, I, I hear you, there's kind of a little bit there, right? All right, how many of you think that Abimelech is the bad guy in this story? Yeah, all right. So, verse 56 says, Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. 
So yeah, Abimelech, clearly bad guy in this story, okay? But keep reading. Verse 57, God also made the people of Shechem pay for their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jeroboam, came on them. So who's the bad guy? Everyone. Everyone's the bad guy in this story. There are, I mean, there is, everyone's the bad guy, right? Now, it's kind of a little bit of a trick question, but I set that up, and I wanted us to go through um, this exercise for this reason this morning, because again, like, why is this story in here? Because, you know, if, if, the, if I stopped this morning with the application, I'm like, gang, don't murder your 70 brothers. Be like, got it, we're good. 99% of you would be like, got it. There'd be one that'd be like, what about just one? <laughs> so clearly, I mean, the application here is, I mean, okay, don't be like Abimelech. That's an easy one, right? But would they spend a whole chapter for that point? I don't think so. Because it's, it's, it, it doesn't go, it's completely different than any of the other story in Judges. Why do they spend so much time on this story? Is it a warning for future kings of Israel? Don't be like Abimelech. Is that why it's in there? No, the story of Abimelech is a warning to Israel and to us about compromising things of spiritual value in exchange for something of worldly value because the consequences are never worth it. It's a warning to Israel and it's a warning to us. It's just like Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And so specifically for the people of Shechem here, what it is is they made the trade. They traded uh, against God's command to let me pick your king. They traded against Gideon's command that I'm not going to be your king and my sons aren't going to be your king. They traded all those things in the hopes that their city would be this capital of Israel and they would reap all the political, economic, and social benefits of that. And so we remember how I said that Bimelech killed all of Gideon's sons except one. So the story says that Gideon's son, Jotham, survived the massacre. And I skipped this part uh, in the chronology, but I want to go back to this uh, for a second here. And uh, this is in verse... Uh, it starts in verse... starts in verse 7. Uh, so picture the scene. So this is, during, this is when the Israelites are making Abimelech the king... Uh, it says it takes place in this valley, and that this, this, the son that survived is up on Tosses Valley, and he yells down uh, this parable. Um, he says, Listen to me, the citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, Should I give up my oil by which the gods and humans are honored to hold sway over the trees? Next the tree said to the fig tree, Come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, should I give up my fruit so sweet, so good and so sweet to hold sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, come and be our king. But the vine answered, should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and humans to hold sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. And it goes on to say that basically says, hey, you know, if you've acted honorably here in making Abimelech your king, then good luck to you. God bless you. But if not, and it's, I mean, there's a little sarcasm here. I mean, clearly they hadn't. It's like, and if not, then, hey, I hope you burned. I mean, that's essentially what John, Jonathan's saying here, okay? And so, you know, when I was reading this uh, to prepare for this message, I read that passage, and I, I put my Bible down, and I was like, i got to think about this one for a little bit, because there's, there's a lot to uh, this parable. And actually, I'll be honest, the first thing I thought about was, you know, remember in the Lord of the Rings, when there's the meeting of the ends, when all the trees get together? That's what I picture this being like, okay? I'm going to be honest, like, okay? It's what I picture. But the second thing is, like, I mean, how true is this parable, I mean, how many leaders in your life have you encountered that are more like a thorn bush than an olive tree, right? What is it about positions of leadership and power that seem to attract thorny personalities? And the personification here is perfect because, I mean, you listen to the thorn bush's response. He says, come take refuge in my shade, right? Have you ever seen a thorn bush? It's like three feet tall. The leaves are like this big, 
What kind of shade do you think a thorn bush could provide? None, right? What it does provide are little pokey things that prick you, and they dry out and they cause forest fires, okay? That's what a thorn bush is good for. It's good for nothing. And so the people of Shechem traded their souls for a thorn bush of a leader. They tried to make a king, and they got burned. And so there's a lesson here, though, that's a little bit broader than just the king part. Um, because, again, I mean, like, how are we like the people of Shechem? We're probably not going to go murder our 70 brothers, right? But a lot of times we sacrifice spiritual things in exchange for the hope uh, that something of worldly value is going to be worth it. And so, the, you know, the hours that we have in a day are not unlimited. I mean, we are finite. We can only fit so much into our lives. Something gets included and something gets excluded. And how do we decide what is worth it to include and how do we decide what's, worth, what's not worth it that we should not include in our lives? And I think a lot of times we negotiate with ourselves or kind of rationalize the things that we include into our lives that maybe are not a things of spiritual value and we're, we're pushing out things of spiritual value to have something in our lives. I think we, we kind of rationalize that at times. But it's, a good, it's good to, to think about these things because, again, going back to what Jesus said in Matthew 16, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? I mean, for the people of Shechem, they could have asked it this, this way. What good would it be to have a king of Israel rule from Shechem if it's not the king that God picked? I mean, that's how, that's how you could have asked this question to them. But for us, you could ask any, any one of these questions. What good would it be if I made a ton of money but never saw my family? What good would it be if my kids excelled in an activity, but I didn't have time for any authentic Christian community? What good would it be if I bought a new house, but we couldn't afford to give to God's kingdom anymore? What good would it be if I had an active social life, but it developed a substance abuse problem to support it? What good would it be if everyone thought I had it all together, but I couldn't confess my problems to someone to protect my image? Uh, what good it would be if I had every single streaming service out there, but I never had time to read the Bible? And I mean, I, I mean, hear me out. I'm not saying that these things are mutually exclusive. I'm not saying that it's one or the other. But the point is, we have to ask ourselves these questions. We have to ask ourselves about the goals and the things that we're pursuing in our life, about whether those things are worth it. Because they're subtle. I mean, it's not like you're doing it consciously. You know, they, they creep into your lives. And the more that it creeps in, the more you push out the good things to the point when you get so far down the road you know, that's when all the bad stuff happens. But if we can check ourselves and say, okay, I need to think about the things that I'm excluding spiritually because I'm trying to fit worldly things in my life, it'll help. Or another way to look at it is if you're making a, good li- a big life decision, you need to measure that life decision with what's the sacrifice spiritually I'm making here? Is it worth it to sacrifice that? All right, so one last question. We talked about who the bad guy was. Who's the good guy? in this story. And I know you're tempted to say the woman who chucked the thing over. I mean, she's, she's an important character, okay? But who's the good guy? God's the good guy, okay? And here's why. Yet again, the Israelites disobeyed him. Yet again, the consequences of their sin caused calamity and search and destruction. But once again, God does not turn his back on his people. Judges 10.1 says, After the time of Abimelech, a man named Issachar, named Tola, son of Pua, the son of Dodo, rose to save Israel. So God again raised a judge to rescue Israel. Here's the two things that are different about this story that's, diff- that's different from the other parts of Judges. One, the people of Israel never cried out for repentance here. It doesn't say they asked for a judge. God still provided it. And two, who is the enemy that God is rescuing them from? He's rescuing them from themselves. And see, we see throughout the Bible this perfect balance between God, who is perfect in justice, and God, who is perfect in love. The citizens of Shechem committed a terrible sin for turning their backs on Gideon's family, and God brought justice and made them pay for their wickedness. Abimelech ruled with nothing but ambition. It cost so many people their lives, and a great city was destroyed. God brought justice and made him pay for wickedness. So, there was a, so the sin had a price, and it had a cost, and they had a debt to pay. But did the Israelites get what they ultimately deserved, which was to be gone? No, they did not. God did not turn his back on his people. He always saves them in the end. He always redeems them, and he always calls him back to them. That is grace. And thank goodness for that, because do we get what we deserve? No, we don't. Our sin has a cost too, but God paid for that cost on the cross. 
And, you know, I want to kind of close with this point because when you read stories of the book of Judges, it's so hard to get caught up in all the violence and destruction and gore and, and all these things in these stories. It's really hard to lose sight of all these stories point to the cross. Jesus is there in all of these stories. Because, you know, even in spite of our sin, in spite of the Israelites' sin, God had, gave them a redeemer, rescued them, saved them, called them back to him. That's what God does to us. And so really the big picture for Judges 9, and, and you could say this about all the stories in Judges, you could end every sermon, every sermon in this series with this point, is it all points back to God's love for his people and God calling them back to him in spite of their sin.